End of life issues touch all of us at some point, but many in this country still die without the support that they need to end their lives well. This year, we've been exploring how philanthropy can make a difference to change this. So conversations like the one that you're gonna hear tonight are really helping us to understand this complex issue better. Tonight's guest is Dan Diaz, a dedicated patient, patient's rights advocate and the widower of Brittany Maynard. As most of you know, Brittany's story made nationwide headlines in 2014. After being diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, Brittany chose peace over pain and to die with dignity. Brittany and Dan moved from California to Oregon, one of only four states at the time where terminally ill patients had the option of medical aid in dying. She died in November 2014 at the age of 29. Honoring Brittany's work and memory, Dan is strongly committed to expanding end-of-life options nationwide. Dan continues to advocate for laws granting greater access to aid in dying medical services, making strides in states and regions like California, Colorado, Washington, D.C., and Hawaii. Joining Dan tonight is Dr. Don Gross, a hospice and palliative medicine physician and host of KALW 91.7 FM's <coughs> Dying to Talk radio show. Dawn has been caring for people with life-threatening illnesses for over a decade, and her work helps transform the experience of end-of-life conversations from dread to discovery. We're pleased to have her be part of this important program. Now, before the conversation starts, please join me in welcoming Dan Diaz for a short presentation. Brittany died November 1st of 2014, um, and tonight I'm going to share with you a little bit more than the sound bites that were in the media um, so that you'll have an understanding of what um, the reality of what Brittany was facing. Um, but to begin, I'll take you back to our beginning. Uh, Brittany and I met um, in 2007. We were engaged and got married in September of 2012. We bought a house and started settling into our lives together. A few months after our wedding, Brittany started having headaches that would wake her up. In the middle of the night, she'd start throwing up and be able, uh, unable to go back to sleep. The headaches seemed to subside for a few months with a prescription for migraines that a specialist had given her. Um, they, had, they didn't perform a, a, um, um, an MRI or anything at that time, that specialist that she saw. Um, but by the end of that year, this is 2013, the headaches were back. Um, and on New Year's Eve, while we were in wine country, I had to take Brittany to the emergency room because the pain was getting too intense that day and something just seemed terribly wrong. After an MRI, they discovered that Brittany had a brain tumor, that it was very large, and that there was no cure, only certain treatment options. Just 10 days later at UCSF Medical Center, Brittany endured an eight-hour brain surgery simply to debulk. Essentially, it's to remove the tumor material that they could safely get to in order to create enough space in her skull so that the current symptoms would subside. Three to five years of life was the time frame that she was given. <clears throat> Unfortunately, just two months later at the first follow-up MRI, the tumor showed signs that it was growing aggressively, indicative of a GBM, a glioblastoma multiform. Uh, and they then informed Brittany that six months was all the time she had left. Brittany was determined to live, and we researched every treatment option that was available that was both here in the United States as well as internationally. Unfortunately, the standard options of chemotherapy and radiation, those might give her two or three months on the back end but she would start feeling miserable right away from the harsh side effects of those treatments. I'm not afraid to die, Brittany said to me one day. I'm not afraid of death. <clears throat> death does not have that power over me anymore. Those words were not just lip service. I knew Brittany truly meant that she did not fear death. But I am afraid of suffering, she said, especially since I will die anyway. I would prefer to die gently, not struggling and in pain. Early on, Brittany brought up the topic of medical aid in dying. 
Um, at that time, it had been available in Oregon for 16 years, but it was not available to her here in California. The, the parameters of this program, just to explain that, two physicians independent of one another have to agree that this person is terminally ill with six months or less to live. That person has to be mentally competent. They make the request both verbally and in writing. There's a 15-day waiting period. In between those requests, there are witnesses involved. These are the safeguards that are in place, and Brittany felt incredibly protected throughout the entire process. So those are the parameters of the program, but what might be some of the reasons for pursuing it? The fear of being tortured to death if the brain tumor was allowed to run its course, that was the one thing that terrified Brittany. It had already been explained to us by her medical team, and a simple search on the internet will give you the list of horrific symptoms that a person with a brain tumor might endure as they are dying. But on top of that, both Brittany and I each had a friend whose parent died, one of a GBM, the other of a stage three brain cancer. So we knew what was coming firsthand. And that included pain that could not be alleviated with morphine. Dilaudid is four times stronger than morphine, and Brittany was on some hefty doses of Dilaudid. Personality changes were one minute the individual seems normal, the next minute they might be agitated, cruel, or violent. Seizures that become increasingly frequent and severe. The mild seizures would leave her unable to speak for 20 to 30 minutes. The grand mal seizures, when she had those, those would leave her exhausted typically throughout the following day, uh, sometimes with blood coming out of her mouth because she's bitten through part of her tongue. That's just the reality of what she was dealing with. The probability <clears throat> that she would go blind as the tumor grows and puts pressure on different parts of the brain, the likelihood that she would lose the ability to speak and communicate altogether. Uh, it's not uncommon for a brain tumor to cause a stroke, and depending on what part of the brain is damaged due to the lack of oxygen during the stroke, she could lose motor function, the ability to stand, walk, swallow. Partial paralysis was likely complete paralysis, a possibility. Brittany said, I will not die that way. Why should I be forced to? Any assertion made that in 100% of the cases we can control a terminally ill individual's pain and suffering at the end of life, it, it's simply not true. There are certain cases where <clears throat> an individual still does suffer. Brittany decided to live the life that she had left to the fullest. I took a leave of absence from work. Brittany found a house for us to rent on Craigslist in Portland. She established residency. We found a new medical team, said goodbye to our friends and family, packed up half our house in California into a U-Haul and drove 600 miles north to Portland. Nobody should have to go through that, leaving home like that after being told you have six months to live. Once we were in Portland, Brittany then applied for, qualified for, and was finally granted the prescription for medical aid in dying. That was in May of 2014. But that wasn't her focus. <clears throat> she put the medication in the cupboard and she focused on living life. Brittany's passion was being outdoors in nature. So we went to Yellowstone National Park. She hiked glaciers in Alaska with her friend, a physician. We went to Olympic National Park in Washington, Hood River in Oregon, and we took a helicopter tour of the Grand Canyon. And in addition, to focusing on, uh, focusing on living life and doing the things that matter to her, we also sent her packet of medical information to all of the clinical trials that offered any glimmer of hope. When you have cancer, you fight. <clears throat> I emphasize this because the media incorrectly focused uh, its attention on death with dignity laws and there are groups that seem to suggest that, a per, that if a person applies for this, that they've somehow given up. That couldn't be further from the truth. When you have cancer, you fight. And having this medication emboldened her to fight. Up until Brittany received the medication, she could not escape the torture that the brain tumor could exact upon her. 
But all of a sudden, because of simply having the medication, that fear vanished. Brittany had taken control back from the tumor. <clears throat> a, qu a quote I found, to conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. And another, wisdom is antithetical to fear. In fact, it's what, enable, it's what enables a person to overcome fear. Brittany showed wisdom beyond measure for deciding to fight that cancer from Oregon. Just to demystify the medication, uh, because over the past three years, I've heard all kinds of crazy things. The prescription is a sleeping medicine. Sequobarbital uh, is the name. It's been around for over 80 years. So long before there was Ambien, if a person had difficulty sleeping, you might get a prescription for sequobarbital. I'm careful to explain this because I've heard people refer to it as a singular black pill or, or that it's an injection into a person's IV. The biggest safeguard is that the terminally ill individual has to be able to take the medication on her own. Brittany has to be able to consume that sequobarbital. It's a regular prescription. There's 100 capsules. Those capsules have to be opened. The powder is emptied into a glass. It's mixed with four or five ounces of water. Um, it, it's, it's a whole process. Brittany died gently on November 1st, 2014. Within five minutes of taking the medication, she fell asleep very peacefully. Within 30 minutes, her breathing slowed to the point where she passed away. That was the gentle dying process that this program afforded her. That is not how her dying process would have gone if that brain tumor would have continued to run its course. A quick side note um, regarding words and terminology. Um, medical aid in dying is the term that you'll hear me use. Um, there are those um, that attempt to apply the term suicide. Um, euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. The term suicide is neither applicable nor appropriate um, in describing this medical practice. My wife, Brittany, wanted to live. A suicidal person wants to die. Brittany was not depressed, despondent, or making irrational decisions, all of those being the characteristics of an individual that is suicidal. A terminally ill individual that applies for this program is not choosing between living and dying. The living part, that option is no longer on the table. She is only choosing between two different methods of dying. One is gentle, peaceful. The other would be struggling. Euthanasia, um, another favorite term used by opponents, I'm not sure why they use it, because that doesn't apply. If, if there's a third party administering anything to an individual, um, that is euthanasia. That's illegal in all 50 states. Uh, but it's something that a lot of times gets conflated and, and, and thrown into the mix. One last note, uh, and, and this comes uh, directly from Brittany. Medical aid in dying is not at odds with hospice and palliative care. Brittany had a wonderful palliative care team at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, and the support we received from the hospice facility was immeasurable. This program is very narrowly focused, and it affords a very small number of individuals like Brittany that find themselves in this predicament. In Oregon, that number is 0.3%. It's a fraction of a percent over the past 20 years um, that have had to utilize this program. Um, I was going to save this, um, this clip towards the end, but uh, logistically, I think it makes sense. I'll, I'll play it now. So, I hope to enjoy however many days I have left on this beautiful earth and spend as much of it outside as I can, surrounded by those I love. I hope to pass in peace. The reason to consider life and what's of value is to make sure you're not missing out. Seize the day. What's important to you? What do you care about? What matters? Pursue that. Forget the rest. So to conclude, Brittany's story, it's a story of love. It's a story of determination. 
It's a story of living life, and, and it's a story of triumph. Many times when we talk about this, um, this idea that we're talking about death and dying, no, her story is actually about life and living. In the end, Brittany did not die as a victim to cancer. She died in the same manner that she lived her life, with grace, compassion, and love for herself and for her family. Um, so with that, um, Don and I will now proceed with the rest of our conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dan, for your courage ongoingly to share this. And thank you, Sarah, for the generosity of making this conversation possible. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Dr. Don Gross. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician, which we'll explain in a moment. <laughs> and a host of a radio program called Dying to Talk on our local KALW station here. And I'm really honored to get to be with you this evening and, and look forward to many of you participating in this conversation. You have continued to share in honor of what Brittany has shared via the video and, and so much more is that this is all very much about seizing the day in her words and about living life fully. And I wonder in your experience um, if you can share what it's been like, this wrestling of feeling a pressure that there's an at odds of if one were to choose a path toward an inevitable death, which is what we all face. Mm. Um, why is there this tension that's being felt? And, and something you've shared explicitly is that hospice is not at odds, palliative care is not at odds. Right with medical aid in dying. Right, yeah, the, the uh, Brittany thought it was a huge injustice that we had to leave the state in order for her to have this option. An option that she was hoping she wouldn't have to use. An option that, um, you know, the, the hope is that hospice and palliative care, and, and I mean good hospice and palliative care, I mean, it, it was not just her physician, but this was comprehensive what I think we would consider to be the gold standard, where there's a social worker and a physical therapist for, you know, the different pains that were just coming up and um, counseling and therapy sessions that we were going to. So she just thought that there was something wrong with our system here in California that why do we have to leave the state in order for her to have this option that will provide her with peace of mind? Um, and, you know, truth be told, we had medications that were just as lethal. So let, let's be honest, this, this goes on behind closed doors across the country. Uh, typically, as soon as, you know, if a person is at end of life and... Um, once morphine shows up in the home, liquid morphine, what, one drop is five milligrams. Well, how many drops is it going to take? Um, and so Brittany just thought through all of that and just decided that I will focus on living life. Um, but, you know, if things get bad, and, and they were, those seizures were getting more frequent and more severe, and, and her concern was um, if she does suffer a stroke, and she's in a predicament where maybe she is paralyzed and now she can't consume that medication on her own. Um, she wouldn't be able to utilize it. She would be stuck dying the very way that she was trying to avoid. So yes, very much Brittany's words and now what I continue, the message that I try to share is that as far as living your lives day to day, appreciate one another and, and, and the relationships that you build and that is what's important in life. But, but as far as the dying or a conversation about dying, that's important, have those too. Create an advanced healthcare directive. If you don't have one in this room, have the conversations with your loved ones. You're, you're, all you're doing is alleviating a lot of stress um, down the road that might come up. Um, you know, uh, the way to ensure that we do have a, a good end of life, a good dying process, is, is, to, is to talk about it, to have those discussions. Um, so I thank you for that question, because a lot of what the media focused on was just this program. In Oregon, it's called their Death with Dignity Law. Um, but Brittany's message was so much broader than that. 
it, it truly was about improvements need to be made in end-of-life care. Um, and, and, you know, the way that we ensure we have a good death is, is to talk about it. Um, and, and that phrase even might sound strange to some people. After going through what we went through, to me it doesn't. No, a good we only get to do it once. There's no, there's no rehearsal for it. There's no practicing it. That's it. You get one shot at it. Um, so, you know, take strides to ensure that um, we each have a good death. Uh, that's just the continuation of having had a good life, in my, in my view. You know, it's interesting why you say, you know, we, we only get to do this once. There's no rehearsal. And yet, you actually shared how you had some exposure to this in that you both had very close friends who close you... parents. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that there is a learning curve, perhaps. I imagine when you got married that you didn't immediately set down, whether it was on your honeymoon or after, like, and let's do our advanced directive. Like, can we just do that now? Yeah. I mean, and now, having lived this, mm -hmm. I suspect you have different words of wisdom, perhaps, for yeah. newlyweds or beyond. Yeah, when Brittany and I um, were married, actually, I did have an advanced health care directive. Um, Had you shared it with her? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, Actually, so and, and at that curve. time, it was that you know I needed to make changes because now her as my spouse uh -huh. would be the one, whereas before it was you know siblings and parents that would have been decision makers. Um, but you're absolutely right. It, you know, Brittany was 29 years old, and we're newly married. You're not thinking about oh, we need to talk about death and 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 how things might go. I, I, I think the life event that changes that for most people is when they have children. When they have children, and, and I, I've at different conferences when I've, um, that I've spoken at, the number of times that individuals have come up to me and shared that it's not only that they had children, that should have been enough of motivation for them to draw up those, those, uh, that, that paperwork. It's that they had children, and for the first time, they were leaving the kids at home, and they were taking a trip to Europe to wherever, and all of a sudden, they realized, oh, no. If that plane goes down, who's taking care of the kids? Is it going to be her parents or her parents? Well, we don't like his parents. You know, her, this <laughs> uncle's crazy. Keep him away from that. all that. Um, so, yes, my words of wisdom now um, when I talk to uh, whomever about this topic, and I've been in rooms full of attorneys where, you know, they can make these uh, a living trust, advanced health care directive, all of those forms, um, and they haven't. Um, but um, I, I tell people, if Thanksgiving conversation gets too political, <laughs> honestly, it, it, it sounds strange, but try it. Do it. Just sit. When you've, when you've had a few glasses of wine, just start questioning. It's like, hey, what would you want? And it's, it's an interesting conversation, and it's not people, you, you, you find, you'll find humor in it. People end up laughing or, or you know, um, uh, sharing things with one another, and you recognize that, okay, this cousin would want everything done, everything possible, ventilators, the whole thing, whereas somebody else might be kind of on the other side of that spectrum saying, you know, no, if, if, um, if death is coming for me, just allow that to happen. Um, and I, I, to me, those, those are the conversations that avoid the politics and, and, and the strife at, uh, um, during Thanksgiving and, and talk about this instead. So. Well, and what quickly evolves, my sense, in the video that you shared and in the stories is, is that it is the stories that come up about what matters in life, right? right? And that it's not so much about ventilators or medical treatment options as it is about, well, what are the things that I want to be doing? And you shared, even in the throes of the possibility of seizures and what have you, that you were in a helicopter over the Grand Canyon. Yeah. I mean, that this was life. Right. And, and I wonder, as you are hearing and watching and honoring Brittany, what's happening for you? We hear her words of, I'm not afraid to die. What's happening over for you? So during, during the, that, that 10 months, um, 
Brittany and I actually talked about this when she would have a seizure, just as using that as an example, um, because she would experience it, but I was the one watching it and seeing her face contorting in ways. A seizure is nothing more than electrical impulses in your brain, just kind of all of them firing at the same time. Muscles are contracting, and, um, and you know, she's making expressions that she could not replicate if she tried after that seizure has passed. And there were a few times where Brittany would say, Dan, this must be harder for you in some aspects because Brittany knows exactly the pain and discomfort and the suffering that she's enduring. I'm sitting there and, and you know, there were times where it wasn't as bad um, during the months of, you know, early on when we moved to Oregon. Um, July and, and August and, and even into September, you know, but September and October, the later half of September and October, things started getting really bad. But for me, I just always imagined that everything must have been on that pain spec. Everything was always a 10. That in the middle of the night when she can't, you know, I wake up and she's still awake and playing Scrabble. And, and I'm just like, ah, oh, you know, I, Sweetie, can, you can't sleep tonight, and, and let's, you know, that heating pad, and have you taken the meds, and, and you're doing everything you possibly can, and so there were a few times in those instances where Brittany would say, you know, Dan, this is, this is killing you as much as the cancer is killing her, just because emotionally, you, you go along for that crazy ride as well, um, but m my role, the role of any loved one family member is to provide that support. Um, I've had the question asked, well, what were your thoughts about moving to Oregon? I said, you know, it, it probably took me all of 10 seconds to recognize if that was me with that tumor that I showed the image of, if, if that tumor was inside of my skull, I would have been saying the same thing to Brittany. If things get bad, we'll do what we can to, to fight this, but I want to make sure that my dying process is not like our friend's parents and what they experienced. Um, so, yes, as, as the family member, as the loved one, um, you, you go through the ringer. Uh, and, and then there were the times where Brittany was actually able to get a decent night's sleep, um, and those would be the evenings that I would be wide awake. And the constant thought that's going through my head is, there has to be a cure for this. It's just a question of finding it. It's out there somewhere. It's got to be. Do, they're, they're doing this, they're, they're, they're the, the polio virus. They're taking that and mutating it, and they're injecting that into the brain, and it's actually eating the cancer cells and not affecting the healthy cells. And they've had great success. Yeah, we sent Brittany's packet of medical information. She didn't qualify. The protocol, that tumor, they, it's like, yeah, no, this is way too big. Sorry. Um, but in your head, in my head, that's what I'm thinking. There has to be a cure. <clears throat> 15,000 people every year in this country die of a brain-related cancer. Um, that's really not a big number. So it is rare. Um, and, it, you know, it was just that, well... In 2014, Brittany was one of those individuals. Um, but, you know, as I said, is she is the person going through it. She is the one experiencing um, those, uh, the discomfort, the inability to sleep, the nausea. Um, but at the same time, I don't, I don't want to focus too much on that because... She, uh, we also are able to focus on our trips to um, uh, Olympic National Park in, in Washington. That one in particular, I remember specific moments from that where she just had such a good time. And you, you can forget about the, uh, the cancer and the doctors and the hospitals and the appointments and everything else and, and just be present with one another. I mean, you shared um, with me in another conversation that, as you outlined, the hospice team support yeah. um, that surrounded you, the gold standard, if you will, I appreciate that, um, that it wasn't 
only for Brittany, for her physical and emotional well-being, but it was also for you. Mm -hmm. And that creating this team around you could help remind you each, it sounds like, as individuals as well as a couple of who you are in the world. And it sounds like that's really what what you were both focused on, of how do we keep living this life that matters to us. And, and that's kind of this progression that when we discovered that tumor, um, immediately you go into the mode of what's the cure? We, we have to get rid of this thing, that, that tumor. That What's the cure? How do we fix it? From there, it transitioned to, okay, well then how long does she have? Uh, and then from there, it transitioned to uh, once we found out six months, it's like, well, then how do we maintain her quality of life as long as we possibly can? And what can we do to extend her life as long as we possibly can? And that is where hospice, palliative care, um, I find a lot of times when I'm speaking with legislators, I'm educating them as to what those are. And so the, the very field that... Um, 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 that, that Don here works in is something that a lot of people don't know much about. And so I'm educating them as to, here's what Brittany's palliative care team was doing for her, providing her, um, and then hospice, the resources that come along with that, not just for the patient, but for the family as well. Um, they then start understanding that um, end of life, especially with, you know, the aging population, baby boomers, I, uh, this I think will be advantageous to bringing more focus and, and, and hopefully more spending on end of life care because um, yeah, baby boomers, they're not going to stand for anything less than you know, top notch care, I hope. And, 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 and with their voice um, and, and just that that's, that is gonna be something that um, the medical profession um, care in that end of life, um, uh, it, it will hopefully expand and, and become where, you know, stri we've made a lot of strides the, um, uh, now that physicians are actually reimbursed for having conversations about end of life. That was a huge step, and that took a lot of, a lot, that, that took years to make that happen. Um, and of course we should, a physician should be able to talk uh, to a patient about end of life care and options and everything else. Um, so I, I think um, I'm optimistic, um, but I, I do believe a lot more needs to be done. We have a couple of questions here from our audience. Um, one of the questions is, do you see any positive changes? I mean, you're alluding to some mm -hmm. as far as physicians now being reimbursed for having conversations about all options of care at the end of life. Um, do you, have you experienced a change in the way that care is being delivered with a focus on quality, even when quality of life is inevitably diminishing? Do you see a shift in the kind <clears throat> of care? I, I have, and for that, I'll take the, the, um, the feedback that I've that I've gotten regularly from palliative care physicians and, and, uh, when I've been asked to speak at a palliative care conference um, where they are, they're saying that yes, they, we are making strides, there are improvements. Um, geographically though, that, that it's kind of dependent because in large um, cities, we see that care and we see those departments growing. Um, I was in Council Bluffs, Iowa to speak at a conference and there was one palliative care physician for I don't even know the size of the geography and he was saying that he's it, you know, it, it's him. Uh, and, and even that word palliative care, uh, that's something that he's having to introduce to his patients. So, um, Improvements, yes, they're happening, but probably a little bit, um, it's moving a lot, uh, along a lot quicker in, uh, in, in large metro areas. Um, interestingly though, there, there is still something for these rural community, communities. Uh, you know, I was in Omaha, Nebraska, places where I've been, where there is something to be said for, they don't know all these fancy terminologies like palliative care necessarily, 
But it is just neighbor taking care of neighbor, and sometimes that is the very thing or the best type of care that an individual could receive. Um, I shared with you um, the story of, of another individual. Her name was Jennifer Glass, who she didn't like going to the hospital because the hospital was always cold. It felt cold to her. She wanted to be at home around her, uh, what was familiar. And um, in places, um, small towns that I've visited where there might not be the, the actual palliative care physician, um, the care that neighbors provide one another and the resources that they just kind of pull together. There, there was something in that that was just touching to me. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I hope we continue to see an expansion of, of end-of-life care. I think that points to some of the angst I certainly experience in hearing your story, and I suspect everyone in this room does, as you talk about this need at the time to pick up your life mm. and move to a place where you had no family, you had no community. And while it, it sounds like you were able to create one to some extent rather quickly, uh, nonetheless, the idea of this being a communal experience. So not only is it hard for you to leave, but what is it like for the community you've left? How right. are they going to navigate what is a tremendous loss for them as well? Yeah. And so while now the end of life option to act, which is this version of the law that Oregon has, death with dignity, now that that exists here in California, you wouldn't necessarily have to pick up and leave because you live here, but at the time it didn't. Do you have any sense, because now you're back here, you've moved back. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was the experience for your community in leaving? <clears throat> it was hard. Um, we did feel somewhat isolated. Um, and there was also, I think part of it, uh, touching on something that you initially said, I think culturally, it's also something that we just need to get over. Um, we fear conversations about death and dying as a society. Um, and, well, let's do a little audience participation. Um, <clears throat> by show of hands, how many people in this room plan or expect to live forever? <laughs> it's a we doctor got, right there one raises hand. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the reason I mention that is just to say that death is not failure. Death is a part of living. It's a part of life. It's happened to everyone who has come before us, and it will eventually happen to each and every one of us. More specifically, as this applied to, for a terminally ill individual like Brittany, death was not failure. For a terminally ill individual like Brittany, suffering would have been failure by the medical community. And so, getting back to your question, that's the reason that, yeah, we, she decided that we need to move, and, and, and I already made reference to that. And she was making that decision, recognizing that we are leaving our community behind, and we're going to have to establish a new medical team and all those other hoops that she had to jump through. Um, I guess that's really, again, why, why she spoke up. Um, when all of that media attention hit, um, you know, Brittany did not set out to be the face of this movement. That's a label that the media attached to her. She was trying to help, pa to help move legislation forward. Uh, and all of a sudden, on October 6th, um, when that, her first video um, was put out on YouTube and Compassion and Choices, the nonprofit organization that hosted that video, um, and then the media coverage was everywhere. Brittany Menard was on CNN and CBS, and, and within two days, you know, 12 million hits on YouTube, and everyone's talking about her story. Um, she spoke up because she thought it was, as I mentioned, a huge injustice that we had to leave. Um, and she was, kind of, she was trying to speak up for the little guy, for people who may not have had the resources or the ability to, to get out of the state like we did. Um, and that just speaks to her personality. 
that time that she spent focused on that, um, that really wasn't time that we, you know, that we weren't upset about that time because she felt she was doing something for the greater good. The time that we do feel that was robbed from us was the having to move part. And so it gets back to the effect of having to leave that sense of community. That was the part that was like, no, this is ridiculous. You know, that is the time that I want back with her. That is the time that we, th that's what we should not have had to have gone through, that experience of, of up and leaving. Um, so I, I can't say enough of how important it is to have community and your familiar surroundings around you, uh, people around you and uh, loved ones and your pets. Initially, we, we had to leave, um, you know, the dogs behind and eventually they, we, we brought them up there to the house in Portland. But um, yeah, sense of community, it's, it's human beings, we rely on that. Um, we are not solitary um, beings. We, we need community and family. So and that, that was terrible, uh, having to start that over up there. And I imagine, again, while you created a medical community, that was probably the easiest part in a sense. Yeah. You know how to connect the dots, and people here could probably help you there. That isn't the same as your life community, your living community, and, and to hear... Um, that you didn't even have your dogs at the beginning. Like, I mean, that's so fundamental, I think, for people who are pet lovers. Like, this is... Yeah. Th and that you are giving those things up for the sake of uh, a future that you absolutely don't want to experience. Right. Yeah. Um, a, a question here that I think speaks to a lot of what you've just mentioned um, is around language. It's something we've talked about of the choice of language, the choice of the words we use when we describe caring for people, medical care. In particular, um, this question is pointing to the use of words such as fight and struggle. Mm. And, and it comes up a lot in the, in the world of cancer care. We fight cancer and, and you yourself used it. Um, and yet the, this person is asking, if death is part of life, and that's our universal reality, then why do we relate to death as a failure? Do we need to use this language that has us pitting something that's inevitable as a loss, as a failure? And is there another way to frame all of this where we're not constantly at odds? That's a great question, and actually to whomever asks that, I, I need to change my own vocabulary because I do use that term, fight, from the standpoint of just trying to get that point, trying to get the point across that Brittany hadn't given up. Um, we were looking at the different alternatives and options. Um, there's a physician that I met in um, Massachusetts, uh, Dr. Kligler is his name, He's suing the state of Massachusetts. He himself has metastatic cancer. Uh, and he, uh, we're trying to move this legislation through um, the, uh, the state house, but outside of that, he decided, I may not have the time to wait for that process, so he sued the state of Massachusetts as a physician, saying that he should have this, this right. Um, and whenever I've talked with Dr. Kligler, um, He's one who is very careful about that terminology, that we're in this battle against or fighting. Um, because as, as was alluded to, well, since we do eventually die, all of us, um, does that mean we somehow failed? No, I refuse to accept that any of us are fail because eventually one day we die. That, that, would make, that wouldn't make sense at all. Um, so... With that, I'll say that uh, point well, well taken, and, and um, I'll make a change to my presentation uh, as a result. Um, but that is absolutely correct. That, that is not the, uh, the way that we want or should frame. Um, in a sense, yeah, we are battling against those cancer cells, I sure. guess. You know, we're trying to bombard those, those cancer cells with everything you can throw at it chemotherapy, radiation, what else can we do? 
Um, but uh, we need to be careful that we don't make it seem like um, no. And, and GBM, by the way, what I mentioned, if it sounds familiar, that's because that's what Senator John McCain died. Um, Ted Kennedy, um, Joe Biden's son, Bo Biden. Um, so it is, a ve- it is a very aggressive cancer. And that idea that we are fighting um, is, is probably not uh, a good way to, to frame that. Perhaps savoring life, right? Yeah. We want to continue to live out in a manner that we've known ourselves that whole time, right? That's it's not true. just about breathing. Right. That was not going to be enough for Brittany. It was no. about living how she knows herself to be living. And that's also why for her, the option of chemotherapy and radiation, um, she asked a lot of questions of a, a few different neuro-oncologists and... Um, with the size of that tumor, in her case, they would have radiated two-thirds to three-quarters of her brain. So in addition to the scalp burns and the cognitive deficits and, and, and then the chemotherapy, of, you know, the nausea and the vomiting, the, the physician said, well, you're not going to have the energy to get on a plane to go to those destinations. You won't feel like going on a hike because you'll be puking. Um, and, and so that was what Brittany was having to weigh. And, and just like we do with any medical decision that we make, the, the benefits versus the, the side effects. But I'll, I, I'll interject. That's a pretty extraordinary sure. conversation in that often we don't, as physicians, necessarily focus on anything but how will this make that cancer get out of that area, right? So to add on... Oh, you told us you want to go hiking? Oh, well, this may get in the way of that. Right. Is pretty unusual, I think. And, and it doesn't need to be, but it takes something, I think, on all our parts to bring that into the conversation. And I think that's where Brittany, in some regard, made it easy on her physicians, certainly on the family members. She was such a determined person that... All you, all you had to do was just listen. These are her goals. This is what's important. And she did not take kindly um, <clears throat> to the attempts. Uh, well, you know, we understood and, and, and um, we understand the reason for it, but any attempt at sugarcoating or blowing sunshine was met with a swift rebuke. You shared, and, and you've even been described as an advocate, a patient advocate, but you've also shared that you each had your own sort of personal medical advocate guiding you uh, throughout this, where you could bounce anything off and say, hey, tell me the, tell me the truth. Don't sugarcoat this, in case right. someone was. And, and I wonder if you can share, now that you've had that experience and, and can, in a sense, step up to help advocate for others. What does that really mean? And how would people know they have an advocate or that they want to get one and and where can they find one? Yeah, and that part wasn't easy. So um, what Don's referring to is Brittany had her best friend as a physician and a good friend of mine from undergrad uh, is is a doctor. He's also the um, uh, medical director of of, um, a hospice care facility. And so... At the end of any given appointment, we would hear a lot of medical lingo and, and sometimes um, even the reports, the paperwork that we'd be given, Brittany would pour over that and, and look everything up online and, and try to make sense of it. But um, for us, it was also just as easy as uh, to pick up the phone and call. I would call my friend and say, hey, what does this mean? Uh, or when the, the early on the medical, the hospital that she was at, uh, he could just look up her records uh, because he was affiliated with that hospital. So that level of sort of that the that inside information um, um, for us that was so meaningful. And so the question of how does how does one because you can find, I, I, I now, my insurance is, is Kaiser. Um, and 
if an individual goes through the process with Kaiser of applying for medical aid and dying, they, you are actually assigned a, um, a patient advocate that kind of helps that individual and says the very process that I described, um, the, what's required, the diagnosis, a person makes a request verbally and in writing, the waiting period, all of those things. And so that individual can be the, that advocate um, pertaining to that process anyways. Um, but yeah, how do, you, how do you get a person like that? And more so, how do you get a person that you trust? For us, these were, this was a friend that I'd known since, since college and for Brittany, um, similarly. So, um, I, I wish everybody had a Sarah and an Epi. Um, that's m her friend and my friend. Um, I don't know that I have an answer for that, though. Um, do, do you turn to the, your insurance company? Do you, uh, or, you know, to similar to Kaiser, the, the, the medical group, and, and ask and start pressing in that regard. Um, Brittany was a great advocate for herself, and then when she was not feeling good, then, you know, I would step in and play that role. Um, but at times it, it isn't, it isn't easy. Uh, I, I guess I, I took my cues from her and it was, you just don't take no for an answer. Well, I'll, I'll plug palliative medicine. <laughs> I'll just make a little plug that if you're finding yourself in a place where the world has just turned upside down for whatever reason, yes, and you don't necessarily have these go-to friends at top of mind, then ask your friendly neighborhood palliative care team for some support. And that's a great point. Actually, I, I, that, that's, I should have mentioned that and sorry that I didn't, but I've been at judicial hearings trying to move this legislation forward. I've been to 12 different states, uh, state capitals, and it's, it just breaks my heart how many times I've had an individual walk up to me um, after the hearing is over um, and they'll introduce themselves by saying, hello, my name is fill in the blank, and I have stage four cancer, fill in the blank, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, whatever it is. And a lot of times they're asking me um, questions about different studies, or did Brittany try this, or what about that? And one of the first questions I typically ask them is, do you have, or have you included a palliative care specialist on your team, and if they say, well, no, what's that? Then that's always my response, is I say, the first thing you do when you get home is you find one, and if they're not in your area geographically, that's okay, find one, um, because, again, the, the support that we received from, from Brittany's was, was truly um, something that, you know, we wouldn't have made it without that. A, a couple questions here about um, engaging other organizations in this cause, mm -hmm. right? In, in, and particularly those that may be opposed to medical aid and dying sort of upfront, such as faith-based faith organizations. How would you s advise people who want to become involved? How would they approach such organizations? Um, so to talk through just to give some, some data, some numbers, because I've, I've always been kind of a, a numbers person, professionally anyways. Um, nationwide, 72% of the population agrees with Brittany that a terminally ill individual should have this option at end of life. So in that regard, we're in good company. Um, the biggest opponent, since you mentioned faith-based organizations, the biggest opponent to medical aid and dying uh, is the Catholic Church. And I know that I frustrate them because I'm Catholic. I went to Catholic school, St. Joseph's in uh, Alameda. Uh, I was an altar boy. Um, Bishop John Cummings of the Oakland Diocese presented me with the Adultari Day Award. It's an award for service in your Catholic community. Um, and <clears throat> um, curiously, support amongst Catholics nationwide is 70%. So it's right there, almost mirroring the general population. It's one of those, one of those yet another, I would say, um, topics where it's unfortunate that the leadership of the church has taken such a hardline stance against medical aid and dying. 
um, because the congregants, the people that I go to church with, um, they say, no, this is a decision that belongs to me. This belongs to any one of us. Um, this should not be left up to a legislator or a judge um, or a, um, you know, the, the head of a, of a, of a, of a religious institution. Um, so as far as getting involved, the organization, I mentioned Compassion and Choices. It's a nonprofit. It's been around for over 30 years working in this end-of-life um, care space. So again, just to emphasize, yes, medical aid and dying is a part of what CNC does, but it's not the only thing. Um, they will also be ones that they have uh, on their site, if you go there, truth and treatment. And that's about just having these, what we would consider tough conversations uh, with your doctor and how to have those conversations. And you go through, they ask you questions, you come up with this postcard, and next time you have an appointment with your physician, there you go. Just hand over the postcard and say, I, I want to talk about these things. Um, so organizations that are out there, um, just because Compassion Choice is near and dear to my heart, um, I would say I, I'd recommend that one as a good place to start. Check out the website, uh, CompassionAndChoices.org, or the, the one that I had, um, the BrittanyFund.org, also that will, will link to uh, CNC's website. Um, and um, I was, when I was in Massachusetts just a week and a half ago, I went to church um, and I had a conversation with the priest and um, the individual that I was with introduced me, uh, introduced me as Brittany Menard's husband and he knew who that was. And um, it was fascinating just hearing him share his experience, because priests, they are individuals that, as far as giving last rites, they, they are in those spaces when a person is dying. A lot of times they, they will be in the room. And so he had personally been affected by, in a couple of instances, what that individual was suffering through as they died. And um, he, of course, could not come out or probably wouldn't publicly uh, say one way or another regarding his support for medical aid and dying. But it, um, it was satisfying for me just to know that he had left enough space in his head to at least consider what I was sharing with him and to consider um, uh, what Brittany was enduring. Um, so I, I think... Uh, as people understand the reality of what this is, um, then they're less afraid of it. And I think that number of 72% nationwide, you know, will continue to move up. One of the things I'm hearing sort of throughout our conversation is this focus on thinking through, talking out loud, planning for, while focused, focusing on what matters most in life, living life fully. Right? That, that it's this dual thing. And so one of the questions um, that was in my head, and I appreciate someone in the audience just writing it down, and, and, and I have to pause for a second, because it starts with Dan and Dawn. And you just need to know, my brother's name is Dan, and so to see Dan and Dawn written next to each other, just like Your caught brother's me. brother's here too. Like, this is <laughs> fabulous. Um, so thank you both for this conversation. Um, the question, though, is why, what had you create an advanced directive before you even got married? Because that is unusual, and I just need to flip back to that, and I appreciate the prompt here. And how do we move this very human conversation that we're so afraid of way upstream? How does it become part of, say, when you, as this person suggested, you know, get a driver's license, hmm. or when you graduate high school or college? Like, how does it just become part of the stuff we do yeah i've i've tried to um tie that into um employers health care or just any time you're signing up for insurance that, that that would sort of just be a requirement um of if you're to find yourself in this predicament do you want what life-sustaining measures would you want um for me actually i had filled out my advanced health care directive um just about the time that I met Brittany, 
Um, in college, I was a lifeguard. I was an EMT. So I guess it, the, that experience in my head, it was just something that had been brought up enough where I thought, okay, I, I should do this because it's a benefit to me, but really it's the benefit to your family members that they don't have to guess well, what did Danny want? I don't know. Did he ever talk to you about it? No, he didn't talk. It, it, it's so, um, so that's how it came about for me, just because I'd had limited but some uh, exposure to um, people being in an emergency room or in the back of a hospital, and they're concerned about, you know, what's going to happen to them. And then when their loved ones show up at that emergency room, they're thinking... What happens if this person, if they're, that individual is now unconscious and they have to make decisions for them? Um, so that, that was what got me to fill mine out. Um, but I would be open to any of those suggestions of you get a driver's license or you register to vote, any, anything. Because, again, it's not, it shouldn't be a scary conversation, seeing as how this is something that we all have in common. It uh, doesn't matter your thoughts or beliefs or political preference or anything else. No, no. At the end of this, we, none of us get out alive, right? So let's, let's just face that reality and, and plan for uh, a good uh, end-of-life experience. All right, so I have two questions left for you. Mm -hmm. um, one which is near and dear to my heart, and I really want to know your answer to this. So the medical community is not always receptive to palliative care. I didn't say that. That's on this card. Surgeons and oncologists sometimes say it's not needed or it's premature. If we were told that, how would you advise us to respond? Find another doctor. <laughs> Just that easy. It, Brittany would not stand for that. The, and only because I've spoken at enough of these conferences, um, not picking on oncologists, I've met wonderful oncologists, but, and I heard it from palliative care physicians at a few different locations. I'm sure people in the audience have heard this before, but... The joke is, why do coffins have nails in them? And the answer is to keep the oncologists out. <laughs> and, and it's true because a patient gets put on this medical conveyor belt and it's like, oh, no, no, don't worry. We have this surgery. And if that doesn't work, then we have this chemo. If that doesn't work, then we have this. And, and at some point, it comes to asking that patient, what, what are your goals for the time you have left? What matters to you? Uh, and, and so, you know, more than <clears throat> when you speak with someone who works in hospice care, the story that I've heard repeated over and over again is where the family is almost in hysterics, reaching out and saying, you know, our loved one's dying, we need to, and, and that person is within a couple of days, and they're dying, and, and you know, the hospice care nurse shows up and they get them enrolled and they do all the paperwork and everything that we went through with Brittany. Um, and, and the hospice care facility, they're saying, you know, you should have come talk to us two, three, four months ago um, because that's, that's the right way to go about that. And then you really understand the, the benefits and the resources that hospice has. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you can never have those conversations too early. Um, so my last question for you uh, it comes from the audience, and, and I'm like-minded. You know, you didn't sign up for this job. You did not sign up for this. What's on your bucket list? Well, um, well, from a work standpoint, um, I, 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 I do this because I did make a promise to Brittany um, to help pass legislation in more states. Um, before she died, there were four states that had um, this legislation, Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and Montana. And now since Brittany died, we've passed this legislation in California, Colorado, D.C., and a few months ago, Hawaii. So we're up to eight states. Um, so, you know, legislatively, I'll continue working on um, moving things forward. Um, and I know Brittany's story has a big impact, and, and it has certainly been a help uh, in, our, in, our, in those efforts. Um, from a personal standpoint, you know, it's, it's one of those that uh, I can no longer fight for Brittany. 
she's dead. So now I fight for the rest of us. Selfishly, who knows? If I live to be 92, Brittany died at 29, but turn those numbers around. If I live to be 92 and I find myself in that predicament, it's like, well, I would be the beneficiary that, uh, okay, at least I know that I don't have to leave the state. I, I have this option. Um, so that, that's something that I, um, you know, in, in honoring her and honoring her legacy, um, I remain focused on, and uh, there's some therapy in it for me. Thank you for, for everyone's here, everyone who is here, because sharing her story with you, um, it, it is... It goes a long way in my heart to fulfilling my promise to her uh, because by all of you hearing the story of Brittany Menard, the real story, um, my hope is that you share this with your friends uh, and maybe it does um, encourage or lead to you fill out your advanced healthcare directives or <laughs> you take certain steps to have these conversations. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that makes me... Yeah, well, it's how I honor Brittany, and, and so it, it's keeping my promise to her. That's important, um, but it's for the rest of us now. So, thank you, Dan. Thank you. It's thank really you. been an honor. Thank you. Our thanks to Dan Diaz, patient <laughs> advocate and husband, widower of Brittany Menard. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you all for being here. And special thanks to Sarah and the Northern California grant makers for generously supporting this conversation. I'm Dr. Dawn Gross, and this meeting with the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>